In the previous video, we worked on building this definition of the definite integral. We talked about how we went from this finite approximation, that's the Riemann sum, all the way to a more exact sort of solution for that area under the curve. In this video, we're going to be looking more closely at this definite integral and talking through some of its properties. Right? So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's talk through each piece of the definite integral just so that we know what, uh, what does what. So over here, we have f of x. That's our you know, v of t. That's our velocity function. We're finding the area under that guy. This guy right here is called the differentiable, the, the differential, excuse me, <laughs> the differential, and this represents the sort of delta x that we used, that, that, that uniform width that we used to work with the Riemann sum. Now, the reason we use dx instead of delta x is because if you remember, we made that width so small, right, because we stuffed infinitely many rectangles in the interval, we made this width so small that it's almost negligible. That's why we use a dx instead of a delta x. dx represents an infinitely small width of anything. You might remember this from differential calculus when we use dy dx, infinitely small change in y over infinitely small change in x. And that's what that is for. But more important, another really important aspect of the dx is this particular guy right here is going to be your variable of integration. Your variable of integration. For the purposes of this class, you need to make sure that whatever's over here matches whatever's in there. Right? So if you have an x, if you have a dx and you have f of y, uh, that's going to be a bit of a problem. Right? You, that's still an integral you can do, but in this course, uh, you might run into a few problems. So for this course, just make sure that whatever you do, you have x over here and x over here, or y over here, y over here. This variable and that should match. Right? Last but not least, we have the bounds. Right? So a and b here, these represent our bounds. So these are sort of, rep these represent the start and finish point for whatever interval we're finding the area on, under the curve for. Right? You might also remember this as a particular time interval over which we're finding displacement. Right? So this is basically what those bounds represent. Right? So that's just a quick overview of the different parts. And with that, let's go ahead and look at some properties. All right, let's go over some properties. So the first one here, the integral from a to a of f x dx, uh, that's one, that one's going to be zero. Now here's why. If you can imagine, right, like if we're finding the area under a curve from a to a, that's kind of like finding the area under a point, right? Because there's there's not a lot of there's that's all the curve, the quote unquote, there is between a and a, right? So it would be like finding the area under a point. Points don't have dimension, so that area is going to be zero. Okay. Next one here, we have the integral from b to a of f of x dx. So you can rewrite this as negative, it's the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Right? So the reasoning behind this is if you are going, you know, if you're, um, if you're going from time one to time two and you've accumulated a certain displacement, if you go backwards from time two to time one, with the same velocity function, that net displacement, that the magnitude of that's going to be the same, but it would be in the other direction, right? So that's why we have this negative sign here. So you can, whenever you see the integral from a to b or b to a, you can always switch the bounds here by just adding a negative sign. You can always switch the bounds on your integral by adding a negative sign, right? And that's going to be that's a pretty useful trick you can use um, in uh, to solve it different several classes of problems, right? So this one, the sum difference property, that's very, that's basically the same thing as it is in derivatives. With integrals, if you see a sum of functions inside an integral, you can split it up into two separate integrals there. So you can make this the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from a to b of g of x dx. Okay, so you can split that up like that. This one's a little more interesting. So if you have some value c here, right, that's in the top of your first integral, the bottom of your second one, right, you, this, you can sort of squish these two together into the integral from a to b. That's a bad integral. Let's, let's do that again. You can, you can squish these two into the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Right? Likewise, you can also go backwards in this property. 
right? If you have some integral, you can take any point C between these two points and break up the integral into two separate integrals from A to C and from C to B, right? So this property goes both ways and it's a really useful thing to have, yeah? So that's another, that's another one. And the last one here, this one is also analogous to what we, have, what we see in differential calculus. If, you, if your function is multiplied by some constant here, you can pull the constant out in front of the integral, right? So this is the same thing as C times the integral from A to, or that's B to A, so this would be from B to A of f of x dx. All right, two more properties here. So for this first one, um, we have the integral from negative a to a of f of x dx, and f of x is an even function. This, as it turns out, is going to simply be 2 times the integral from 0 to a of f of x dx. And let's look at why. So if I drew a graph of an even function, let's, let's do a simple one, um, maybe y equals x squared. Right? We do a sketch there. Notice that we accumulate a certain amount of area to the left of the y, the, uh, y axis and a certain amount of area to the right of the y axis. Yeah? And even functions, by definition, are always symmetric about the y axis, right? as this uh, left-hand portion will always be a mirror image of this right-hand portion, so whatever area I accumulate over here under the curve on this side will be equivalent to whatever I accumulate under the curve on this side. Right? So these two areas here will be the same. As a result, instead of taking the area from negative a to a, I can just take the area from 0 to a and then just multiply that by 2. I can just, in other words, I can just look at this piece over here, for example, multiplied by 2, and I'll get this entire uh, area there. You can also write this as the integral 2 times the integral of negative a to 0 of f of x dx, although the computations you would do for this thing might be slightly different depending on the, the function. So, so that's that. The next property here is for, for odd functions, we're going to evaluate the same integral here. Right? For odd functions, this is actually going to be 0. And again, let's look at an example to show us why. So if we look at an odd function here. Let's pick a, a pretty basic one, maybe the x cubed, or maybe just y equals x is a pretty basic function, right? y equals x, yeah. or y equals any number times x also would work. Yeah. So for this one, you'll notice here that we, we do accumulate a certain amount of area on this side. Right? We can call that a. But we're also, we're also accumulating negative area on this other side here, like underneath on this other side here, we call that negative A, right? So, and odd functions now, by definition, are symmetric about the origin, or symmetric about y equals x, yeah? And so, any area I get over in this part here, any positive area I'm accumulating on the green side, will be equivalent to any area I accumulate on this red side here, this negative area. These two areas will be equivalent to each other in magnitude, but since this one is negative and that one's positive, they will cancel each other out to give you zero. Right? So that's why for odd functions, this is true. This one is honestly a really, really nice property. It's really useful, and we'll, we'll do a really cool problem that actually demonstrate this, demonstrates this uh, in a different video, but uh, this is a super useful property. And one more thing to note, though, is that both these properties only hold true when, of course, the functions are even and odd, but also when you're dealing with symmetric bounds, right? If you have anything that's not negative a to a, like if it's 3 to 2, for example, this property will not hold up, right? Because you'd not be, you would not get such a clean symmetry here, yeah? So therefore, your bounds have to be symmetric, or else you will not, these properties will not apply. That's another important point there. And that's really all our properties. So let's go ahead and look at uh, a quick example before we wrap up the video. All right, so let's do a quick example here just to sort of uh, run through what we've just covered. So we want to find the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x dx, given that the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x is 3 
and the integral from 3 to 0 of f of fx is minus 7. So we're not actually told what f of x actually is, but we're told what these two other integrals are. So we'll need to find a way to use our properties to use these two pieces of information to get us our final answer. So one thing you'll notice is that this integral has a 1 down here. This integral has a 1 over here, up here. This integral has a, a 3 over here, and one of our integrals over here also has a 3 over here, and both these have a 0. So we could potentially use that property where we can squish two integrals together if they have this other value c. We could potentially squish them together like that, but they're in the wrong spots, right? So what if we added these two together, what we would get is the integral from 3 to 1 of f of x dx, which is not quite what we want. Right? because we want the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x dx. So instead of just adding these two integrals together, what we're going to do is we're going to have to flip them first. Right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x dx is equal to, well, we have to flip this first integral, right? So we're going we're gonna to add on a negative sign. So we're going to say negative times the integral of 0 to 1 f of x dx. Remember, this thing is equivalent to this is equivalent to the integral from 1 to 0 of f of x dx. Right? And then we're going to do the same thing for this guy. So we're going to have a negative the integral from 3 to 0 of f of x dx. And of course, once again, keep in mind, this is equivalent to the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx. And if you add these two green integrals here, we get the exact thing that we're looking for. All we've done is we've just put them in a form that allows us to use the given information here. Right? So if we put these together, what we end up with, now we can plug in our numbers. So this will be minus 3 minus negative 7. 3 minus negative 7, that's going to be a negative 3 minus negative 7, that's going to be a positive 4. And that will be our, our final answer. Cool. So that's it for this video. I hope you found it helpful. Please do leave a comment if you have any suggestions for things you'd like to see in the future. Our next videos will be on indefinite integrals, which are a lot of fun. We'll spend a lot of time in that region, and then we'll come back and talk about some more about definite integrals when we talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that's it for now. Uh, thank you for watching. If you found this video helpful, please do like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, and check out some other videos. See you next time.